When the pandemic hit, companies were forced to adjust for a remote workforce, and now many are making official, more flexible work arrangements. Tech giant Cisco is the latest to announce a hybrid work policy, setting no mandates for the number of days required to return to the office. Here now to tell us more is G2 Patel, EVP and GM of security and collaboration at Cisco. Thanks so much for joining me today, G2. Thank you for having me, Alyssa. It's great to be here. So what exactly is behind Cisco's decision to have a formal policy for this so-called no return to work? You know, other tech companies are offering hybrid models, but some are still mandating certain number of days in the office and Cisco is not. You know, the way that we think about this, the future of work is definitively going to be hybrid. Uh, people are sometimes going to want to choose to work from home. Sometimes they're going to want to choose to work in the office, sometimes somewhere in the middle. And so our task is pretty clear, which is we want to make the best place to work or the best workplace in the world now becoming the world's best hybrid workplace, where you give employees a choice so that they can make sure that they can choose to work from anywhere they want to. Because the way we think about it is work is what you do, not where you do it from. Mm -hmm. And now many people have over a year of this uh, remote model under their belts. So there are new norms in place, but there are still potential hurdles that can come from remote working like communication and trust, just some of the issues there. So how do you work around those issues to make for an efficient workplace? You know, listen, I can speak of the, about this from personal experience. When I joined Cisco, uh, it was all during the midst of the COVID pandemic. And for the first 10 months, I had actually uh, barely met anyone in person. In fact, I'd met my boss, Chuck, maybe a few times. Um, and most of my peers on his leadership team, I had never met. The first time we met, it, it was really, it was interesting because I considered a lot of them my close friends, but we had never actually physically met in person. So I actually do believe there's a way that you can, you can build relationships. Uh, the thing that you need to have is it's not as much of a cultural shift as it is a technology shift that needs to happen. And those two have to go together. And so the way that we've actually seen is, you know, the way in which you structure meetings, make sure that there's enough wander time in the meetings so that you can get to know each other better. There's nuances of that sort that are pretty important um, so that you work together. But um, in, in, in the long run, we do believe that flexibility is going to be so important for access to the best talent in the world, where if you do want to get the best talent, you ideally want to not make sure that that's constrained to a geography. And in order to be inclusive, we want to make sure that people from anywhere in the world can participate in a global economy. And we want to make sure we lead the charge on that front. So rather than dictating from the top down what happens, we'd love to make sure that every team decides what the best pattern of work needs to be and make sure that they can figure and construct the team that way. And so we've given a lot of flexibility to employees and we want to make sure that everyone has an equal voice in the way they participate in the global economy. And the technology, of course, is what is enabling this future of work. How is Cisco adjusting to the changes and the needs of its clients that are, have, we've seen over the last year in the pandemic and that we could continue to see as remote working more and more it seems like it's becoming the norm? Yeah, the way we think about it, Lisa, is we're in the third phase now. So the first phase was when everyone pre-pandemic worked in the office and there was a couple of few stragglers that worked remotely. The second phase was when everyone went remote. And the third phase is where, is there, where there's no such thing as remote, where everyone's working from anywhere that you want to have. And hybrid work doesn't really have a remote category because every place and every venue is a first class you know, kind of venue that you can participate from. And technology is going to play a very important role because I think the adjustment to the third phase is going to be actually harder and trickier in some ways that people don't feel left out. So imagine there's, you know, four people in a conference room and three people that are, you know, not in the conference room away from, um, you know, um, the office, what you would traditionally call, call remote. It's important that neither the three people that are not in the office or the four people in a conference room don't feel left out in the conversation and everyone feels like they have an equal voice. So technologies around artificial intelligence, making sure that you can actually have, you know, a, um, a level of uh, focus from a video camera perspective. So even if there are four people in a large room, that the camera is able to zoom in and focus on them so that everyone feels like they're on a level playing field where I can see your facial expressions just as well as I can see someone who is, who's not in a very large room. Those are gonna be important nuances to go out and iterate on over time. 
And uh, we believe we've actually got a huge advantage in that area that we're investing a lot of uh, time and effort and working with customers to ensure that people can feel like they're participating in a global economy with an equal voice where no one feels like a second class participant in a, uh, in a meeting or a conversation. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that this policy will help Cisco attract and retain top talent? Was that part of the decision here? There's there's a couple parts of the decision. Yes, there's of course going to be, you know, it's very hard to find great talent and making sure that, that, that we actually are being as flexible to attract talent from all parts of the world is pretty important because opportunity is pretty unevenly distributed throughout the planet, but human potential isn't. So we should be able to go out and tap into that from anywhere. But there's a larger aspect to this, which is it's not just about access to talent. It's also about making sure that we can avail every human being on the planet an equal ability to access opportunity anywhere in the world, where geography doesn't become this kind of barrier. Look, I um, immigrated to the US um, back in 1991, and it was great because I wanted to come to America and it was great and it's been fantastic for me, but my life would have not been quite the same had I not made the decision to immigrate. And I'd love for the next generation not to have to immigrate if they don't want to. If they want to, that's great. But if they don't want to, they should still be able to access opportunity from anywhere. And that, that to us would be um, a great kind of future to go out and imagine. Uh, and we can now do that very credibly because we've seen the largest social experiment over the past 15 months that's been run, that's been extremely, you know, um, uh, insightful on what, what we were able to do as humans in pushing the boundaries and surprising ourselves on the level of productivity we were able to reach during this time period. Now, as less employees are in the office, is there a plan to maybe eventually relocate Cisco's headquarters for financial purposes if that space isn't being utilized as much for as many people? You know, the way that we think about this is the configuration of the space itself will have quite a shift over time as well. So it's, it's, it's one thing which is, okay, do we need as much real estate or do we actually shrink it down? But the larger issue is how do we configure the space so that, you know, right now, for example, offices are configured where everyone, every employee has a desk. In the future, you might have people come in at different times. Or you might have, you know, we, there, there was an interesting stat where about 63% of the 75,000 workforce, employee workforce that we had at Cisco uh, worked at least three to five days in the office. As we move forward, our projection is 77% will have, um, will work away from the office for three to five days moving forward. So you know that you don't need as many individual desks and you might actually change the configuration to have more huddle spaces and more collaboration rooms. And there'll be things like hot desking that actually get to be much more prominent where People can use any desk that they want, and there'll be technology that's utilized for that. So there's a bunch of areas where there's going to be innovation in real estate on how it gets configured, how much real estate is going to be needed, and specifically, how are people going to engage together when they're in the office versus not. Like People might not come to the office just to get their job done in their closed office. They'll come to the office to collaborate with each other in ways that they would not do otherwise. And that's the, um, the change and the, um, and the structural shift that will, that will happen over time. And it remains to be seen what all the different configurations are that we'll see different companies adopt. But we want to make sure that we provide all the technology components to ensure that um, that's actually a seamless transition. Right now, it does seem like the tech industry is headed this way. Uh, again, other companies have been announcing various policies of their own, but do you expect even more companies uh, and in other industries as well to follow Cisco's lead here? I hope they do because making sure that a um, the way in which you enable a workforce is flexible and inclusive and supportive of their well-being and secure and you know honors privacy and is easy to manage and delightful as an experience to have for the employees so that they get the flexibility i think is pretty important i mean think about a single parent who's trying to go out and drop their kid to daycare at two in the afternoon that does not determine whether or not they're a good good employee that's something that's a flexibility that should be afforded to them so that they can go out and do what they need to do uh, and still have the flexibility to be able to participate in a very ambitious career. 
And so those are things that I think, you know, initially we are starting this by um, just, you know, thinking about, well, some days people are going to work from home, some days people are going to work in the office. But what this is going to allow us to do is give us permission to dream bigger, where we might be able to have anyone from any part of the world, whether it's a village in Africa or Bangladesh or someone in the heart of Silicon Valley, be able to equally participate in the global economy. And that, I think, is something that I hope that the world takes our lead in and in, in making sure that we can all do that in our own way. Well, G2, it's so interesting to hear how work is being redefined and really appreciate your insights today. Thank you for having me on the show. Hi there, thanks so much for watching Investing Strategies on our YouTube channel. If you want more executive interviews and analysis of key trends to watch, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date.